Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Lifestyle Academy. And I've got a friend on here I just met, and his name is Steve Schneider. Are you there, Steve? I'm here. We can hear How you, you loud today? and clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I'm up here in sunny Minnesota, and I think you said you're from Arizona. Yep, Sedona, Arizona, I'm at right now. Beautiful Sedona. country. Yeah, all those. I was through uh, Utah and similar kind of stuff driving through there. I, I've never been to Arizona. My nephew was in Arizona for a while and I should have visited, but uh, I haven't been there. It's beautiful, yeah. I understand. It's gorgeous. And Sedona's got uh, that, uh, there's a lot of like the woo-woo people down there, right? A lot of woo-woos <laughs> here. More, more uh, UFO sightings in Sedona than any other place in the world. More than Roswell, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so Steve, are you married and got kids and that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, married, uh, three sons. Uh, in fact, our youngest son is with us here, uh, you know, waiting out the, uh, the coronavirus. So uh, yeah, it's the three of us here right now at our place in Sedona. Yeah, isn't that just a strange thing? It's just bizarre. I've never experienced. I'm only 62 years old. But I've never experienced anything like this before. Yeah, it, it's crazy. That's for sure. But uh, we're, we're, we're all safe and uh, we're having a uh, a nice time here. Well, similar thing on me, my wife, and our dog. Little three in a pod. <laughs> so I read a yeah, little our, bit about. Our, oh, go our, ahead. Our, son, our, our youngest son, he's, uh, he's scheduled to get married in October. So uh, hopefully this will all be over by then. Well, I'm in the event business, and part of the people that I promote to are wedding planners. And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but if a venue closes, the event closes. There's no wedding planners, there's no limousine, there's no photographer, there's no videographer, there's no dress, there's no music, there's no food. All done. <laughs> so yeah. it's a ripple effect and all that. So, but it'll all sure come back. Is. We will survive. We've been through yes, worse, I think. Or we, yes, we has. will. <laughs> so I read a little bit about what you got. You wrote a book and your father, I believe, was a pilot. Is that true? Yes. He was a B-17 pilot in the 8th Air Force and flew bombing missions over occupied Europe. And on February 8th of 1944, he and his crew were shot down over occupied Belgium. Well, the book goes into detail about what happened to each member of the crew and about all the Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. Wow. I can't imagine what that would be like surviving something like that because being just crashing in an airplane without being shot at it's got to be it's got to be uh, i don't know i don't even know how to relate to it yeah it uh it was pretty horrific they were attacked by two uh, german fock wolf fighters and uh two of the a b-17 had a 10-man crew uh, two of the crew were killed in the plane when it was attacked and the other eight were able to bail out uh, five of the crew members came back home, but five of them did not. So five survived and five of them didn't. After my dad was shot down, he bailed out and came down into some uh, trees. He was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture. He was hidden by Belgian people for a while, and then he got tired of fighting. So he joined the French resistance and started sabotaging German convoys uh, until the U.S. armies came up through France after D-Day and liberated. Oh, it's, it's, it's quite a story. It's just not about my dad. It's about what happened to each member of the crew because something different happened to each guy. Well, it's, it's bizarre, the whole concept of war. And I, I did do, is, uh, I took a trip over to uh, Amsterdam and then we took a, a tour of the Anne Frank house. Oh, yeah. And I can't imagine. I mean, it's just really strange feeling that kind of energy and stuff. I can't imagine being in this situation and, I've, I've never even, I've been in the martial arts, but that's a competition where we both agree that we're going to do this. But <laughs> being in a situation where you're just flying along and someone starts bombing your plane, that's got to be strange. So did, did you, did, did you uh, hear from your dad when you're, I'm assuming that your father's passed by now. Yes, uh, he, he died in uh, uh, 2007 at 91. He wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest. Wow. And uh, 
I've been to Belgium six times. My first time uh, was in 1994 when my wife and I accompanied my parents for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and of my dad's plane being shot down. And that's when it became personal for me because a lot of the houses and farms that he stayed in and that was was, was hidden in are still there today. So I've, I've been in these houses or farms, been in rooms where my dad was hidden. So I get chills just, just talking about it. I know that's a weird thing. Like I was saying, as I was at that Anne Frank house, you can just feel the situations. I mean, people that don't believe in that kind of stuff, like spirits and ghosts and stuff, you just feel it. It's just, I mean, it's, it's just a strange situation. How many different places did he stay when he was over there? Oh, gosh, he, uh, he was moved around uh, a lot uh, from place to place when he's being hidden. He might spend one night at one house or six weeks at another place. It all depended on how brave the people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to, to stay there. Wow. And the people who hid my dad or any down there, for that matter, were unbelievably brave people. I mean, they risked not only their lives, but those of their family and friends, because if the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be arrested, tortured, and either shot or sent to concentration camps. And some of the people who helped my dad and other members of his crew didn't meet that fate. Was it that kind of thing where he's at a place, all of a sudden he hears that uh, footsteps are going to be coming, so you got to pack up and get the hell out of there? Yeah, there's several instances described in the books where he was almost discovered uh, by the Gestapo. Uh, one occasion he had to go up on the roof and spent the whole night on top of the roof uh, because the, the Germans were patrolling uh, that area. So it was... It was very stressful on uh, on my dad, you know, being hidden. I think that's one reason why he got tired of hiding and uh, wanted to get back into the fight. That's why he joined the French resistance, which was unbelievably courageous and brave to do because he could have died fighting the Germans or if they had to capture him, he would have been shot on the spot as a terrorist. Sure. I, I guess I'm a coward because if someone starts shooting at me, I'm going the other direction. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you have a copy of your book with you? Yeah, yeah, got one right here. <laughs> this is uh, the book. Uh, this is the hardcover book. It's available in hardcover, uh, paperback, all ebook formats, and uh, also an audio book. But in the in the print book, there's over 200 time period photographs, so you can visualize everything you're reading about, which wow. makes a, a huge difference. And it's this on Amazon, I'm assuming. Crew. Pardon? Okay. It's on Amazon, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, most people get the book on Amazon. About 60% of all the books sold are purchased on Amazon. But, uh, if someone wants an autographed copy, they can go to my website. It's stevesnyderauthor.com, S-N-Y-D-E-R. Uh, and there on the homepage, there's a little button that you can get a personally signed copy of the book. And it's called Shot Down. Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder, my father. And the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth, his plane was named after my oldest sister, one oh. year old at the time that he went overseas. Well, you got one. I bet you got one heck of a family reunion when people get together. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're spread around uh, in different parts of the country. So uh, we don't get to see each other too much, but uh, we keep in touch. You can do these virtual Zooms and you can get a whole bunch of people on the screen. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> these days. So what inspired you to write the book? I know that you're proud of a fa your father and things like that, but was there something else that just said, you know what, I got to write about this? Um, yeah, I knew the basics of uh, my dad's story growing up, but it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. And my parents had kept a lot of material from the war years that I just wanted to go through and organize and learn a little bit more. And there were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down, which is absolutely riveting. It's in the book. And then the other item were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother while he was stationed in England before he got shot oh, down. Cool. And reading those letters were just absolutely fascinating. And uh, I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew and became my passion. And three, three years into my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. People needed to know about it, so I decided to write a book. So when you got That's, all the data and stuff, was a lot of it like scattered around different dates and times, and you kind of had to pull it all together and get it into like some kind of chronological order? 
Yeah, the, the biggest challenge, I, I was really fortunate to have so much information. Uh, it's all based on firsthand testimony by the people who were involved in the events that took place, either members of my dad's crew, members of the Belgium underground, or uh, declassified military doctors. What I added was just a lot of historical information and anecdotes about surrounding the war to, to put it into the context and give it, give it background. I probably wouldn't have written a book though if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen, Doc Malo and Paul Delahaye, who were young boys during the war, greatly affected by it. And later in life, they became local historians and they interviewed all these members of the Belgium underground about events uh, involving my dad and his crew, and they documented their testimony, and they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that would have been lost forever without their dedicated research. So I owe them a, a huge debt. So how did you get all the photos and things? That must have been a lot of work, digging all that kind of stuff, especially- Well, no, DNA again, that, uh, I was fortunate there. Uh, a lot of the people who hid my dad uh, sent him pictures after the war, uh, so he, my my dad had a lot, and then Jacques Lalot and Paul Delahaye uh, also provided me with lots of pictures. So there's there's many of the pictures were taken by Belgian people in 1944 during the war. Incredible pictures. Oh, you lucked out there. Made your job a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. I just had another thought, and it was in my head when I asked that question, and now it disappeared. It was something else that I wanted to ask about. Ah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> one, one of the most amazing things in my, my journey of writing this book is that I found the German Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane and interviewed him for the book. We oh, become really? friends. Yeah. He's, uh, he's the only person in the shot down story who's still living. Uh, his name's Hans Berger. He lives in Munich, Germany. He's 96 years old. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks perfect English. He gave me some wonderful information that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. There, I got it. The book. The book's right there, shot down. So I remember what I was going to ask about. I think I read in there that you do talks and things. You travel around and speak about this situation. You know, basically... Uh, uh, even though I retired in 2009, I'm working full time again now for Pony in the Book. I go to air shows all around the United States, signing copies. I do quite a bit of uh, speaking, making PowerPoint presentations about uh, the book and uh, the Eighth Air Force and what uh, what it was like flying combat missions over occupied Europe and, and Germany. I was just going to ask who uh, who is your audience for that, and you just answered it. it's air shows. You ever been to the Flying Cloud Air Airfield up here in Minneapolis? In Eden um, I've been to many. I've been to Minnesota. I, I've uh, there's uh, um, well, come on, Steve. I've I've been up to the uh, I'm having a, a couple places in Minnesota. I've spoken. Uh, there's the uh, oh God. I was like, I'm like having a, a, a mind Me too. Freeze. I'm 62, <laughs> and sometimes the stuff just leaves you, you know? You know well, I, I turned 73 years old today, so I guess I'm oh, having a senior well, moment birthday. on my birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Let all that stuff go. Well, there's an airport here called the Flying Cloud Airport. It's, a, it's not, not a big airport, but it's down in, like, uh, southwestern Twin Cities, and they do an air show over there I've seen. So I thought, who knows, maybe you're, is that where you travel around to is a lot of the air, do you do, do, you do any marketing for what you're speaking or just people find you? Well, I, I, I mean, I spend hours on the internet every day in social media, uh, contacting people about the book or promoting the book. But uh, I've been doing this for a few years now. So uh, the, the word's gotten out and uh, it's changed my life. You know, I had no idea that uh, it what would occur and then I'd have this new career after writing this book, but it's been successful. It's won almost 30 book awards. It has a, a five-star rating on, uh, on Amazon. So oh. it's, uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, again, you know, all based on firsthand testimony. Did you ever, ever have a thought of maybe doing a movie? Well, a lot of people <laughs> who read the book say it should be made into a movie. Uh, it, it actually would be a better miniseries because there's so much and different people and different avenues you can go down. Um, my youngest son and I, along with a couple other uh, 
people, we made a, a little documentary short, a uh, 13 minute uh, documentary short that I've, I've entered into a number of film festivals, which unfortunately a number of them this year now have to be streamed because uh, they can't be shown in uh, theaters, but it's done pretty well there. Uh, it's been accepted into uh, quite a few film festivals and won some awards. Uh, so hopefully oh. that'll attract some attention and maybe interest in making it into a movie. Well, you know, that's one of my things with this whole internet thing is you never know what's going to happen, who's going to pick up what for what reason. So it's just a matter of throw it out there and who knows, somebody might Google some word and poof it. Hey, yeah. that's exactly what I was looking for. There's so much yeah, you, you, out there. you never know. Stranger never things know. have happened with this internet stuff. I remember there's a, a thing called the one red paper clip where a guy up in Canada traded a paper clip and he, he traded it up, kept on paper clip for a oh. pen, pen for a notebook, notebook for a, a Walkman radio, Coleman stove, camper. Eventually it was for a house. He traded it up to a house. <laughs> oh, that's quite a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just documented it all. So who knows, maybe you'll start a, like a play or something. There's a friend of mine that started a, a play here called Triple Espresso, and it was just a few guys got together and just started in a church basement. So who knows, maybe you end up uh, doing a traveling play about it or something. Yeah, you, you, you never can tell. You know, that, that <laughs> like I said, yeah, I've been to Belgium uh, six times, and we've done a lot of filming over there, so we have a lot of footage. Uh, in fact, I interviewed a... Uh, Hans Berger, the German Luftwaffe pilot, uh, and part of that interview was in this little 13-minute uh, documentary. That's got to be weird. Together and talk. Now, is that the guy that shot him down? Yes, and actually, the gunners on my dad's plane shot Hans Berger down at the same time. They shot each other down. He oh bailed God. out, and he made it through the war. Yeah. Well, that's got to be weird, too. I'm connecting with uh, somebody that was your enemy, you know? Yeah, but Pretty much, he was like the U.S. airman. He was, you know, a young guy, 20 years old, you know, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. He said it was unfortunate they had to be shooting at each other, but, you know, that was war. That was their job, and that's what they were they had there, there to do. Yeah, I guess it's like that, like in the martial arts, two guys going at each other, and then when they're done, they're buddies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hans was shot down three times. He was really fortunate to make it through the war. Oh my God. I can't imagine. It'd just be so bizarre. Like I said, I, I never even been shot at other than with a pea yeah. shooter. <laughs> yeah, they, those guys, you know, who uh, went and fought, uh, you know, they, they were the greatest generation. I mean, amazing, amazing men. Yeah, they, they were just either late teens and early 20s. You know, a lot of these guys just out of high school, never been out of their hometown before. Some of them. Because back then, the U.S. was very a rural. You know, That's another strange thing. Someone so young going into something so dangerous. It's bizarre. Absolutely. Well, Steve, I don't like to do these too long because I want to keep them tight enough where people can consume all the information. And then what I'm going to do is beam it up to the universe and propagate it out to the internets and we'll uh, see what happens from there. And uh, when I send that out, I'll connect with you on social media too. And if you could uh, share it just like I do, Absolutely. that's where the synergy part comes in and we'll, uh, propagate this thing out on the internet. So Super. how do people get a hold of you then? So what's your website so they can find you? Uh, Steve Snyder author.com. Uh, that's S N Y D E R Steve Snyder author.com. And I'm on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. I have a personal page on Facebook as well as an author page. on, on Facebook. Got it. And there's a ton of information on my website. It's not about the book, but there's, there's lots of videos, interviews, uh, on the website, links to different movies and uh, archival footage about the air war over Europe. Uh, and it's a lot of information on my website about, uh, about the war. Yeah, what I do is I'll probably just Google Steve Schneider shot down and see what comes up and then I tie everything all together. That's how I There you it. go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Steve, I appreciate it. you taking the time today and enjoy the weather down there in Sedona and I'll try and enjoy it up here in Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good,